We're done with obstructive lung diseases, let's talk about restrictive lung diseases. Uh, restrictive lung diseases, we said, is a problem of your lungs expanding, causes that corset, causes that corset. Will that affect our measurement of lung volumes? Yeah. How do we measure lung volumes again? If you recall, we did it with spirometry. So you take a regular breath, we call that your tidal volume, tidal volume. We said you can take an extra deep breath in, call that your inspiratory reserve. We can take an extra deep breath out, that's your expiratory reserve. And there's a little bit of air that you just can't get rid of. We call that your residual volume. All right, so we're gonna keep drawing it until it's like second nature. Spirometry values are always something people have trouble remembering. All right, and another way we can measure it is not only measuring the volume, but how forcefully you can breathe out that volume. All right, we call that your force bottle capacity. And so you take a deep breath in and then you breathe it out. And within one second, you should breathe out about 80%. So FEV1, that's the force expiratory over FVC should be 0 0.8, all right? And hopefully nothing new there. When we talked about obstructive lung diseases, we said that it can affect these. Obstructive lung diseases, you had a blockage and that caused air to get trapped. You couldn't breathe it out and that caused air to get trapped. So when we talked about this, we said that because you have air trapping, you have more volume. You have increased lung volume. You have air trapped in there. You have increased residual volume, all that stuff. When we talked about um, Forcefully breathing it out, we said that you couldn't forcefully breathe it out because you had an obstruction, obstructive lung disease. And so the ratio was less than 0 0.8. Then we say that was a hallmark, all right? So that was obstructive lung disease, but this video isn't about obstructive lung disease. It's about restrictive. That's that inability to, inability to expand. That's that corset. So how does it affect this? Well, if you can't fill it with air, then will that be increased volume or decreased volume? it'll be decreased volume. So you have decreased residual volume, um, all that stuff, and by proxy, you'll have decreased vital capacity. And if you have decreased vital capacity, then by nature, you'll have decreased forced vital capacity. Decreased forced vital capacity. And by just mathematics, if you have a lower denominator, then you have an increase number so this is sometimes over 0 0.8 that's completely opposite we have lower lung volume you have higher FEV1 to FEC ratio that's like completely opposite of obstructive and a lot of um, a lot of questions on these disorders deal with spir spirometry readings okay so if you can decipher the spirometry readings then you're halfway there you're halfway there those are the lab findings those are the lab findings. Now, what causes that inability to expand your lungs in the first place? What causes that corset? Like, um, sometimes it doesn't have to do with your lungs at all, okay? Sometimes it doesn't have to do with your lungs at all. Sometimes you have poor muscles, like um, if you have polio or you have myasthenia gravis and you can't expand your lungs, or sometimes you physically can't expand your lungs. If you have obesity, if you have scoliosis, kyphosis, all that stuff. But because we're in our respiratory block, we're just gonna talk, just gonna talk about lung diseases, okay? Certain lung diseases, will cause fibrosis, will cause stiffening, will cause that corset. So we're gonna talk about those restrictive lung diseases in this video. So lung diseases that cause fibrosis. Now, some causes of fibrosis include things like drugs. If you remember I talked in um, Heme and Onc, we talked about some of cancer drugs like bleomycin and that causes pulmonary fibrosis through, through free radicals. You can also have occupational exposure in your job, you get exposed to things, some nasty things that can cause fibrosis. We can break this into hypersensitive pneumonitis. We can break this into pneumoconiosis. We have idiopathic fibrosis, name gives it away. We don't know what causes it. We have autoimmune causes like um, scleroderma can cause it because it causes collagen deposition and um, tightening of your lungs basically. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis can cause it. We usually think of it as affecting your hands, but it can affect anywhere else because it's a systemic autoimmune condition. Sarcoidosis is a big one and we're gonna talk about that last. So these are all causes of pulmonary fibrosis, causes that stiffening, causes that coarse, that restrictive lung disease. Let's talk about occupational. Hypersensitive means hypersensitive. Um, pneumo means pertaining to the lungs. Itis means inflammation. So you have, you're exposed to something and you get this hypersensitive reaction 
and it causes lung inflammation. Does that remind you of anything? Doesn't that sound exactly like asthma? Doesn't that sound exactly like asthma? How is it not asthma? Well, for starters, it's a type three and type four hypersensitive reaction as opposed to asthma, which is a type one. So it's type three and type four. Also, um, if you give asthma medication to this, it won't help, it's not asthma. So if you give albuterol to someone that has this, will it help? No, it's not asthma. So, so it does not respond to asthma medications. to asthma meds. And probably the easiest dead giveaway is it's a restrictive lung disease. So it'll cause that restrictive findings on spirometry as opposed to obstructive lung disease, asthma. Okay, so spirometry will differ. Some lab findings you should know, you have a low CD4 to CD8 ratio. And that, again, shows you that it's not really asthma. Um, so asthma had a ton of uh, CD4 helper cells, especially TH2. So that just shows you, this low ratio shows you it's not asthma. There are different types. You, have, you can have silo fillers lung. In farms with those large silos, those silos can fill up with nitrogen oxide. And when you breathe in that nitrogen oxide, you can have a reaction to it. So nitrogen oxide, you can have bisonosis, which is seen in textiles. You can have just general farmer's lung. Uh, this is from moldy hay. So you get mold in your lungs. You can get hypersensitive reaction. Oh, there, mold. All right, mold. That actually does it for hypersensitive pneumonitis. So they'll give you a history of like a farmer or something that's working. And every time they work to get chest tightness, you do spirometry, you see restricted lung disease. And then when they're not near the, the occupational exposure, then they're doing better. You're, you're thinking hypersensitive pneumonitis. That's how they ask it on the board. What's pneumoconiosis? Pneumo means pertaining to the lungs. Coniosis means dust. This is not a hypersensitive reaction. This is just dust getting into your lungs. And when dust gets into your lungs, it attracts cells, it attracts them to create fibrosis. So it goes, dust attracts cells which release cytokines, cause inflammation, cause fibrosis, cause that restrictive lung disease, okay? Now, large particles of dust, over 10 microns, over 10 microns, will never make it down to your alveoli. It gets stuck in your upper respiratory tract. But if it's two to eight, then it can get stuck from your respiratory bronchioles up. And this is important because we have our mucociliary escalator. You kind of clear it, right? Less than two, he goes straight to your alveoli and we don't have an escalator there. How do we clear it instead? What do we say was our defense of clearing things instead? Your macrophages, your macrophages. Okay. And so if you can get a ton of these small dust in, then you recruit the macrophages, recruit all these inflammatory cells. You can cause fibrosis, cause fibrosis. What are some special types of dust? You can have coal dust, you can have asbestos, you can have silica, you can have beryllium. Coal dust is seen in coal miners. It's also seen in large cities, especially very polluted cities, basically um, soot. So all right, miners plus cities. There are people that live in like LA or New York. I think that's all I really wanna say about that. Asbestos is seen in roofing. That's probably the most common Thing you'll you'll remember about asbestos is also seen in shipyards. So if they give you a history of someone that's a sailor or someone that works in the shipyard, give me a little tip. And I have seen that asked. So shipyard, and then people that work in plumbers, plumbing. So they'll talk about a plumber. Okay. This really likes to affect your lower lobe, especially near your diaphragm. And when it affects that, it causes plaques and effusions. So it'll cause pleural plaques, it'll cause pleural effusion. Pleural plaques are a dead giveaway. Pleural plaques is probably the easiest giveaway for asbestos exposure. Okay? And if you aspirate those plaques, if you aspirate that effusion, you'll be able to see asbestos and iron bound to it. We call that ferruginous bodies, literally meaning iron bodies. And they look kind of like dumbbells. That's easy to remember. Think of a gym with iron dumbbells, right? So 
you'll actually be able to see all that asbestos and some iron and it stains with Prussian blue Prussian blue now is this does asbestos exposure give you an increased risk of cancer yes you might know it from um, being really related to mesothelioma it also causes other types of lung cancer now which is more common all right which is more common is it other types of lung cancer or is it mesothelioma it's actually other types of lung cancer sometimes we call that bronchogenic so all right number one is bronchogenic number two is mesothelioma why is that mesothelioma just takes longer to develop and oftentimes the patient will die before then so bronchogenic is actually the most common it's a common trick question because you're always thinking asbestos is linked to mesothelioma it has to be the most common and it's not it's the second most common always always asked always asked okay silica is seen in foundries and mining it's also seen in sandblasting and when silica goes into your lungs your macrophages freak out they've never encountered basically these rocks before and they will kind of go hog wild they will go haywire and they will start releasing a ton of cytokines a lot of create a ton of fibrosis so all right macrophages go crazy i will literally right macrophages go crazy okay and they cause that really really nasty fibrosis it can actually expand to your hilar lymph nodes which are these lymph nodes in your lungs and cause calcification calcification of hilar lymph nodes a great picture a beautiful picture will be in my notes right calcification of hilar lymph nodes. so someone coming in is a minor shows calcification of hilar lymph nodes chronic cough you're thinking of silica exposure silica pneumoconiosis okay this has an increased risk of cancer and also an increased risk of tb actually the only one of these that has an increased risk of tb why is that well your macrophages aren't working your macrophages are going crazy all right so they're not able to combat that tb last one is beryllium beryllium and beryllium causes these granulomas that look a lot like sarcoidosis which we'll talk about in a second but these people work in aerospace that's how you get beryllium exposure in the first place so if they say an aerospace worker in the history they're literally giving it away they're literally giving it away okay you can treat it with steroids steroids and these come with increased risk of cancer so these three have an increased risk of cancer with silica being the only one that has an increased risk of tb because his macrophages are going crazy um and then the last important note you should know all of them affect your upper lungs mostly because that's um where you initially get an inhalation exposure right your upper lungs are the most ventilated the closest to your to your windpipe your trachea the one exception is asbestos we said that it likes to affect your pleura and your diaphragm if you can remember that you remember these facts should be golden should be golden let's talk about idiopathic fibrosis no one really knows why it causes fibrosis that's why it's called idiopathic it seems to be an increased tgf beta production which causes collagen deposition causes fibrosis tgf just causes fibrosis anywhere all right that's what causes your cirrhosis of your liver so it just causes fibrosis and they seem to think okay there's way too much of this in the lungs is causing that fibrosis causing idiopathic fibrosis patient will just have this gradual onset of dyspnea and cough when it um, causes fibrosis it can cause these cystic holes so if you look at the lungs it looks kind of like a honeycomb honeycomb and the, again a great picture will be my nose literally looks like that it looks like a honeycomb our last but not least is sarcoidosis sarcoidosis for the amount of facts you have to remember for sarcoidosis most students don't have a trouble getting those questions right uh, there's a running joke that any black female with lung problems has sarcoidosis and a lot of times they ask you like that i hear they're trying to get away from that so just be a little bit more wary okay sarcoidosis what what is sarcoidosis no one really knows it's just kind of mysterious lung disease and it can affect different parts of your body it's systemic but it really likes to affect your lungs and that's why i'm talking about it here sarcoidosis it's probably due to some sort of uh, immune cell imbalance or they're acting in a weird way and it's causing this fibrosis causing this lung disease and if you have all these weird 
reacting immune cells, they create widespread granulomas. They say non-casein granulomas, they shouldn't have to tell you non-casein granulomas. Only time you see casein granulomas is in um, TB or fungus, because they cause that caseous necrosis. So if it's not TB or fungus, it's non-caseating. So non-caseating granulomas all over the place. And you can actually see, you can actually see its involvement in the hilar lymph nodes. It really likes those lymph nodes near your lungs. Why wouldn't it? And your labs will show this kind of imbalance of cells. It will show increased ratio CD4 to CD8 as opposed to a decreased risk or decreased ratio that we talked about in hypersensitive pneumonitis just a second ago. Okay, So it shows an increased ratio. I been asked this like three, four times. They really like this one. Some other lab findings you'll see is increased calcium. Why do you see increased calcium? It's not specific to sarcoidosis. Any granulomatous diseases, anything that recruits macrophages, recruits these making of granulomas, increases calcium because macrophages release one alpha hydroxylase. And if you recall, that is what activates vitamin D and vitamin D brings in more calcium. You see an increase in ACE, increase in ACE, not ACE inhibitor, <laughs> ACE. Uh, again, uh, immune cells releases. Increase in ACE, particularly in sarcoidosis, maybe because it's dealing with the lungs where ACE is found, maybe because ACE is seen a lot in, not only in our RAS pathway, but also in our inflammatory pathway. So you have an increase in ACE. These lab findings are very high yield. I don't like that term high yield, but I'm gonna use it here. Okay, always, always that. Microscopically, you'll be able to see that calcium. And calcium stains blue. We call those swam man bodies. Calcium stains blue. That's a general fact you should remember. And you also see these spider-like, spider-like projections called asteroid bodies. Nobody actually knows what they are. But if you see these spider-like projections, you're thinking sarcoidosis, okay? That actually does it for restrictive lung disease and obstructive. Hope you enjoyed the video, thanks.